Okay, looks like the numbers are stabilizing. So I'll go ahead and get us started with our introduction um, and some housekeeping items. Welcome everybody. We're happy to have you today during our webinar, which is the overview of the April 2024 VCS program updates. Um, my name is Nicole Shermer. I am the manager of VCS program development. I'm joined today by a number of my colleagues who are all going to speak to the updates that their respective teams have been working on. And they are also all going to be available to um, speak to any questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and I'll just gently remind my colleagues that they can introduce themselves um, before they start speaking. Otherwise, you do see their names here on the screen. Okay, a couple of housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Vera website after the webinar is over. I believe that everybody who registered for the webinar will automatically receive a link to the recording and you'll be able to find it on the announcement page of this VCS program update, as well as on the VCS governance and development page after the webinar is over. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar to ask questions, there is a Q&A box enabled on your screen, and you will actually be able to see the questions that other people have submitted, and you can upvote or give them a thumbs up to indicate the ones that you are most interested in seeing us answer. Because we have enabled this transparency, we of course ask that you remain respectful during your questions, and please only ask questions that are relevant to the webinar and not related to individual projects. Any questions that we are not able to answer today can be directed towards a Vera inbox, and we will provide all of those email addresses on the screen during the Q&A portion of the webinar. I think that's everything, so let's move along. Great. So the objectives of our webinar today are to provide an overview of the April 2024 VCS program updates. And of course, as I already mentioned, to answer stakeholder questions about those updates. Here is a quick agenda on the screen. First, we'll be giving an introduction to the updates and also how to navigate them, a little bit of logistical information. Then we'll be going into more detailed descriptions of those updates. And finally, we'll go into the Q&A. A little bit of introduction about the purpose of these updates. We made these updates with the aim to meet all of the conditions for full approval under the first phase, that is the 2024-2026 compliance period of the Carbon Offsetting Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, or CORSIA, developed by the International Civil Aviation Organization. And we also made them to aim to clarify how the VCS program aligns with the core carbon principles established by the Integrity Council for the voluntary carbon market. My colleagues, Justin and Andrew, are online today to help answer any questions related to the reason why we made these updates during the Q&A portion of this webinar. A little bit of logistical information for you. How to navigate the BCS program updates. All of the updates are listed in an effective dates document, an overview and effective dates document which provides a list of the updates and the dates when they become effective. Within each document itself, there is also an appendix, which includes the document history and effective dates of any changes, um, and it also summarizes all of those changes. You can find the links to all of the new versions of the program documents by visiting the BCS Rules and Requirements page on the VERA website, and you can access the old versions of the documents by going to the VCS version four previous versions page on the VR website. We do have a QR code here. If anybody is interested in following along the webinar by reading the information that's provided in the effective dates document, I do hope the QR code works. Um, uh, feel free to let us know in the chat if it doesn't, but otherwise you can find it by Googling April 2024 VCS program updates, overview and effective dates, and you should be able to easily find the document there on your browser. A little bit more information now about effective dates. This is 
general background information um, about how effective dates are worded, since we know that we get always a lot of questions about these. Um, so we're trying to be a little bit um, a little bit better about explaining what effective dates means. So and this information is also included in the introduction of the effective dates document. Number one, effective immediately means that the update applies to all project requests received by the Vera registry um, submitted on or after that release date. And so in this case, the 16th of April, 2024, all project requests refers to any project request submitted to the Vera registry, such as a project registration request or a verification approval request. And then in general, for updates that are not effective immediately, Project proponents, of course, have the option to conform with those updated requirements before the effective date if they so wish to do so. And if they do choose to do that, the validation verification bodies must assess the projects based off of those updated requirements. All right, with all of that introductory information covered, I would now like to pass the webinar along to my colleague Renata, who will introduce herself and talk about the first update. Go ahead, Renata. Thank you so much, Nicole. So yeah, hi everyone. My name is Renata Lozano. I'm a social and environmental safeguards manager for Vera. I'm gonna explain very briefly what are the safeguard updates that we have made under the VCS standard. So we have made main four changes. The first section 3.19.2 refers to um, how we have specified that all of the safeguards should be expected to assess risk and to clarify that any mitigation measure must be commensurate with the identified risks. I'm going to explain briefly in future in a future slide how we have made this update also in the corresponding templates. The section, the section 3.19.10 refers to how we have specified that the project proponent shall identify, minimize, and mitigate any impacts caused, including the, from the release of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. The third change in section 3.19.15 um, refers to the requirement on how the project proponent shall that shall um, prohibit the use of forced labor, child labor, and victims of human trafficking. And within this requirement, we had made the change where the project proponent is also expected to protect staff and contracted workers employed by third parties. And finally, the last change that we have made is within section 3.19.26 where we have updated the requirement to specify that the demonstration of no adverse impact also applies to areas needed for habitat connectivity. All of these changes are effective for all project requests submitted to the Vera registry on or after January 1st of 2025. Thank you, Nicole. I believe I'm now passing it over to Justin. Thanks, Renata. Um, my name is Justin Wheeler. I'm the Senior Director of VCS Program Development. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some of the up other updates that were included in the announcement. The first one is not in the uh, VCS program documents itself. It's it's to the more general uh, Vera grievance and redress policy. Um, so this policy was updated. It's also available on the VCS program details page of the Vera website. The two updates that were included here was one uh, clarification to to uh, clearly state that the staff that would be involved in processing a grievance uh, that's raised through the policy are separate from any staff that would have been involved in the original decision or review for the project. Um, and then the second update, which is not a change, but is a clarification. Um, so the policy was updated in December to remove any fees for people to submit um, grievances through the policy. And now that is stated explicitly in its own section in the grievance redress policy. Um, the next set of updates are in the program documents. Um, so these relate to preventing double issuance. We have always um, 
uh, had controls and requirements to avoid double issuance, but we clarified these to more clearly align with the ICVCM. Um, so the first thing we did is we defined a date for project inactivity. That's in the program definitions. Um, and that's important because the ICVCM requirement specifically states that um, programs should not allow registration of projects that are registered and actively participating in another GHG program. Um, so what we had done previously up until this update is we have allowed double registration. We've required you to disclose it. And then we've checked at each issuance that there's not a double issuance happening. We will still do all of those things, but um, we've now clarified that at registration, if you've ever participated in another GHG program, you must disclose that and provide the date on, um, under which you became inactive in that other program. And we've committed to communicating with the other program to, to say, you know, this project has asserted that it's inactive as of this date, um, so that the other program will know this and, and this similar would happen in the opposite case. Um, because this is a, a slightly new addition to, to this requirement, um, we've put a future date on the effective date of this. So this will be effective for all new registration requests coming in starting the 1st of January, 2025. We will still and always have um, not allow double issuance and check for that at every issuance, but this is a, a further check at the registration uh, stage and the registration and issuance process, <clears throat> excuse me, and the registration representation have both been updated to align with that. Um, next slide, please. Oh, so here's here's the actual definition um, for the date of project inactivity um, and the language from, from the standard stating that uh, the projects cannot register until they are kind of officially inactive in the other program. Depending on the program, that may take a different shape. Some programs have an official uh, inactive status um, or or even a deregistration process obviously would qualify too. Um, others, you just have to not um, submit a crediting request and kind of make make the representation that you're no longer seeking credits under that program. I should note at, before I speak to this next slide, I saw a couple of questions related to monocultures. Um, so this webinar is focused on the updates included in version 4.7 of the standard and the other program updates that were announced um, last week. And the updates to the monoculture requirements after the consultation were in 4.6 of the standard and were announced in, in March, but we can cover some of those questions in the Q&A. So just don't be surprised that we don't have a slide about that. Um, so the updates related to double selling is on, on a similar theme. It, it's never been allowed to sell the same thing twice. In fact, that's, that's fraudulent, um, but we've clarified our program, program documents to explicitly state this. This was one of the conditions um, from ICAO for eligibility for Corsia. They asked us to, to clarify this. Um, so there's a reference in the concept section in section 3.23 of the standard. Um, and then we have added a definition of, of double selling. When we updated all the double counting definitions in the fall of, in August of 2023, we updated the definition of double counting and took double selling out because it's not really double counting. Double claiming is a subcomponent of, of double counting. So now we've added in a back a definition of double selling back in and the registry terms of use have been updated um, to clearly state that double selling is is prohibited under the program. This is not something that a VVB would be checking because obviously double selling can't happen until until issuance. Um, so it's it's more of a downstream control that's included in the registry terms of use. Next slide please. 
The next update is a, again, a minor update, a clarification to the methodology development and review process. Um, so it was a little bit uh, confusing the wording around how we select uh, validation verification bodies to review methodologies that are under development or under revision. Um, the previous language implied that we rank and then we pick the shortlist, um, but didn't explicitly sit, state that the shortlist has to meet all of the um, RFP and, and program requirements. So now we've explicitly stated that. So it's not a change in practice, but a change in documentation to represent the current practice. This is important because the VVBs and the group of experts on the VVB team is the uh, is the part of our process that satisfies the ICBCM or we think satisfies the ICBCM criteria um, around requiring review by uh, experts in addition to public consultation for all new methodologies. Next slide, please. Um, so there are now corresponding updates to the program templates. Renata, are you going to walk through these because they're mainly safeguards? Yes, thank you, Justin. Okay, great. Thanks. So we have updated all of the project templates to reflect the updates that we had made within the VCS standard requirements. Um, they're already available on the website. The updated version specifically related to CCD and the VCS program joint project templates will be revised accor accordingly and released shortly. Um, and these templates will have the same effective date for um, January 1st, 2025 for all project requests. Thank you, Nicole. Next slide, please. Here we have an example of how we have reflected some of the requirements updates within the, the templates. Within the project description, this is just a brief example of how we have updated um, some of the safeguards in order uh, for the project proponent to um, demonstrate what have been the risks identified and per risk report what has been the mitigation or preventative measure that is commensurate um, in relation to that specific risk that has been identified. And the same has been done within the validation report where you um, can now list all of the risks that have been identified and then provide the corresponding evidence um, directly related to that specific risk. Thank you, Nicole. Next slide. Thank you so much, Renata. It's uh, my slide. I'll take over from here. Uh, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Leo Long. I'm a senior manager within the auditing and accreditation team. I'm going to look briefly at what are the implications uh, of these updates specifically for our validation and verification bodies. So the first key update that VVBs will need to take note of is the changes to the safeguard requirements where VVBs must confirm conformance with the safeguard requirements and reporting. As per section uh, 3.19.2 of the VCS standard, VVBs will need to check that the PP or project proponent reports on all sections where they are expected to assist risk. And the VB must confirm that the report of mitigation measures are commensurate with the identified risks. The VVB must also confirm conformance with the wording in the updated sections of 3.19, which are listed here and have been discussed prior. Furthermore, the VVB must ensure that the PP has made use of the updated project description and monitoring reports templates, which are available on the website. Uh, the second key update for VVBs to take note of is the need to ensure that the date of project inactivity uh, is provided and is in conformance with the updated requirements, which can be found under section 3.23.3 and 3.23.6 of the VVS standard. VVBs should note that the date of the project inactivity is found under section 1.16.2 of the updated project description template. Uh, finally, the VVB should ensure that they make use of the updated validation and verification report templates, which is now version 4.4. That's it. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much, Leo, and thank you to everybody who spoke today to give a description of the updates.
So I am now going to pass it along to Justin to do a moderated Q&A session. Um, as you can see here on the screen, we have these several email addresses that you can reach out to to ask more specific questions or any questions that we're not able to answer today during the webinar. So I'll pass it over to you, Justin. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, we have been answering some of the questions in text too. I believe everyone should be able to, to see those, but um, we'll speak to those, a couple of those too, just because some of them are generally applicable. The first one is there was a question about the slides. So yes, we always post both the recording of the webinar and the PDF of the slides um, on the website. So look for that in the next few days. Um, so as Nicole said, we're gonna go by upvotes um, to answer the questions. We have plenty of time, so we'll probably get through all of the questions. Um, but just if you are wanting to make sure a topic gets answered, rather than duplicating a question, it's better to read the ones that are there and upvote um, a question. So the first one relates to Coursera. I'll start, but Andrew, feel free to jump in here as well. Um, so it's about methodologies. Um, and specifically VM47. So the Corsia Eligible Emissions Unit document is a little bit dense. Um, <laughs> at least I find it dense to, to read. So all non-AFOLU methodologies are currently eligible if they meet all the other requirements for time periods and such um, for the pilot phase. For AFOLU methodologies, there's a specific list um, that are eligible for use in red countries um, because of the risk of, of double counting that they're, they're trying to manage there. Um, VM47 is a new methodology that we published um, since the, the last material change submission. So yes, in our next material change submission, we will be notifying um, ICAO of that methodology and requesting that it be uh, added to the list of, of eligible methodologies for the, the AFOLU list of exemptions for the, <laughs> the way they word it is sort of a double negative they sort of exclude um a follow and then they exclude methodology specific methodologies from those exclusions but andrew do you want to add anything on the um, methodology side of the Corsia submission no I, I think that's fine already okay thank you um, so the next one relates to monocultures. I spoke to it briefly before. Um, so there was, I'll just give a little bit more background since we have time. So bear with me if you're not interested in this. Um, so in version 4.5 of the VCS, we included in the safeguard section a, um, a provision that, that said projects that are using monocultures are not eligible um, as a whole. Um, we that came out of the original consultations for 4.5 where we had crafted some specific safeguards around monocultures and then we um, had some feedback that the boundaries of those uh, safeguards were a little bit confusing and maybe we should just make a, a more general exclusion. Um, once we made that update we heard from people who had not been caught in the originally original provision that was consulted on but now were affected by uh, the final wording, um, and we heard fairly clearly that there are projects that use some um, non-native monocultures in limited circumstances and can still clearly demonstrate that all other safeguards, most, most critically, of course, the ecosystem health um, safeguards are upheld. Um, so this would be like converting degraded land and maybe a project has a component of non-native monoculture and a component of natural forest restoration and they need both to make the overall economics and make the project work and in the absence it would just be degraded land that would be um, sitting there being underutilized. Uh, so we did some further consultation on that in the fall um, and then as a result of that consultation we released 4.6 version 4.6 of the VCS standard in March of this year and we clarified some of the other ecosystem health safeguards and remove the specific provision excluding uh, non-native monocultures. So the net outcome of that is we still have very stringent safeguards that all projects must uphold, um, including for ecosystem health. Um, but if you can demonstrate that your non-native monoculture project meets those safeguards, 
then you are eligible to participate in the VCS. Of course, you also have to meet all the requirements of the program and the methodology um, that you're using. The, the question that was asked also alludes to invasive species. So there are separate uh, controls and provisions on invasive species, and again, separate controls and provisions on uh, conversion of, of ecosystems and, and not allowing conversion of, of ecosystems. So when you're looking at those safeguards, I guess the main comment, and Sinclair, I, I see you're off camera, so feel free to jump in here, but the main comment is make sure to read the safeguards as a whole and read the methodology as a whole, because all of those requirements work together. Um, you can't just take one and then imply that everything not covered by one specific requirement is somehow allowed. They, they deliberately work together and we try not to duplicate between the individual provisions. Do you want to add, Sinclair? Yeah, just quickly, um, absolutely agree on what you just mentioned about looking at those requirements as a whole. Um, and just based on some of the questions I see in the q and I just wanted to highlight two specific safeguards. Um, and those are uh, 3.19.27, where we uh, state that uh, the VCS standard does not allow invasive species to be introduced as part of project activities. And then also 3.19.25, um, which says that the projects cannot have negative impacts on biodiversity ecosystems. So two really important uh, specific requirements to consider alongside those monoculture requirements that Justin just mentioned. Thanks. Thanks, Sinclair. The next two questions relate to, um, again, this is gonna be a little bit dense for people who aren't in this world, so bear with us, um, but relate to corresponding adjustments and LOAs, which stands for Letters of Authorization Issued by Host Countries. Um, so it, it's anonymous, so I can't give you credit, but you're absolutely right that those are two of the key conditions that were um, published by ICAO in their most recent conditional approval of the VCS for the first phase um, of compliance under Corsia. Um, so there's no updates in the standard to deal with that. The reason for that is the, the process around letters of authorization and corresponding adjustment is, is dealt with in the Article 6 guidance. And then we have also developed a Corsia uh, label guidance document that, that lays out the intended process for dealing with letters of authorization and risk of, of double claiming, um, or which would include revoc revocation or failure to make a corresponding adjustment by a host country. Um, that's already dealt with a little bit in the Article 6 standard, but we're explicitly dealing with it for the Corsia case in the Corsia guidance, and that will be submitted to ICAO in our submission, and then we would publish the guidance once we get the approval from, from ICAO. So, Rest assured, we're very live to that issue and thinking very hard about it and have some back and forth with, with ICAO to make sure that we come up with a workable uh, solution to protect against that, that double claiming risk. Um, but maybe again, Andrew, I'll invite you to speak up and add anything if you want to add into that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Justin. I mean, uh, this is certainly an area where we're it is very live and we're still working through it. I mean, essentially what uh, ACARI requires us to do is to ensure that if a country does not do its corresponding adjustments, then there is some sort of compensation mechanism in, in place. And there does appear to be some flexibility as to what sort of compensation mechanism that is. Uh, the, the wording of the condition uh, says that either the PPs themselves or the program uh, need to put in place sufficient assurance that there will be some sort of replacement or compensation for, for any credits where a country doesn't actually do its corresponding adjustment as it promised to in the LOA. Um, and I think what I would like to stress in that as well is that we're not expecting that this will arise very often. Uh, I think countries will be very aware that they have a reputation as well and they uh, need to portray themselves as being a secure place to do business. Uh, so we're not expecting that this will arise uh, very often at all, but in the event that it does arise, uh, then NKO does require us to put in place a mechanism to be able to uh, ensure that there's a compensation for it. 
Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so there's another upvoted question here that's kind of on the same theme. Will the VCS be eligible under Corsia with these updates? Did you have any communication? Um, so ICAO, of course, is an independent body. It has its own process. Um, so we, the updates that we've spoken about today are very specifically targeted at um, the conditions communicated by uh, the, the technical advisory body, which is what TAB stands for. Um, so we are, we are very hopeful and somewhat confident that we are addressing all their conditions, but we of course can't state that definitively because that is a decision that, mm -hmm. that ICAO will have to make. Um, and then I think this next one, sorry, just bear with me while I read it. How have you addressed the action regarding a compensation mechanism full wording below? Yeah, thanks for posting, posting the alerting the wording, Luke. Um, I think we've already answered that. So feel free to um, post a follow-up if you want to clarify, but on to the next one. Um, so the next question is about effective dates. Uh, and it might even be worth sharing the screenshot of the effective dates. Nicole, I'm not sure if you have that handy or not. Um, but the there are some updates in the standard that are in effect immediately. Those are the ones that are more like clarifications. Um, the new templates are not required to be used right away because we know that people are in process of developing developing projects um, and in validation or, or verification and being forced to switch to a new template in, on the fly while you're in that process is, is quite disruptive. So we do always uh, provide a time period for the effective dates of the templates. Oh, great, thank you. That's pulled up there. Um, I might just have to zoom in a tiny bit. So I, I think the question is implying that there's a conflict between the uh, standard clauses and and the templates, um, and it has two parts. So I guess one part of the question is, can you can you use it earlier? So yes, the templates are published and eligible for use. Anybody can jump, and in fact, we encourage you um, to use the new templates as soon as possible. We just don't want to require uh, that on too tight of a turnaround so that we don't disrupt somebody who's mid mid audit. Um, and then they're required to be used for requests that are received after that 1st of January date. It's a little bit longer than we typically do for a, a grace period, um, but we're trying to move to having common dates for updates in the requirements. And, and in general, where possible, we're trying to stick to 1st January, 1st July um, for those requirements. So that's that's why we chose that date, but, but please do uh, feel free to use the updated templates earlier. Anything you want to add to that, Nicole? I think you covered it. Um, and as I mentioned before, in this document, every update has an effective date listed in this column. So as you can see, the updates to the VCS standard are listed in different rows. So this first row is about the safeguard updates. That effective date is the 1st of January. This second row is about the double registration updates. That one is also 1st of January, but it's only specific to new registration requests. The third one is about double selling. That's effective immediately because that, as Justin mentioned, is just a clarification of, of what already existed. Um, the methodology development and review process is effective immediately. And then the templates um, are effective on the 1st of January. So hopefully that answers your questions and also gives you a little bit more information about how to navigate this effective dates document. Yeah, and the other thing we should say is that these effective dates are in the effective dates document as a standalone, which gives you the overview of all of the updates. They're also replicated in the document history and effective dates section for each program document. So if you open up the new version of the standard, scroll all the way to the end, you'll see the same language uh, for effective dates in there. Um, okay, the next question is, I would love to have the answer to this. Is there a timeline for when Vera expects its Corsia guidance to be ready for the 
oh, sorry, I do know that part, but <laughs> um, there was also one on timeline for ICAO decision. Um, so ICAO extended its its deadline initially. It had a deadline for um, material change submissions, which is the mechanism we use to submit our updates. Um, originally, that was April 16th. In recognition, I think that there was quite a tight turnaround from the decisions being published to that April 16th date. They extended the uh, submission date to April 30th for this round of material change submissions. So that's the date when we are submitting those documents. Um, there is always the possibility that, that there may be some back and forth after we have that submission. The, the technical advisory body may have questions. Um, so, and we of course welcome that. Um, and then the decisions, they have left themselves a little bit of flexibility in the wording that potentially a decision could come earlier the way I read it at least. I won't speak for ICAO of course. Um, but typically the decisions um, to be made on whether programs are added to the eligible emissions unit document or whether the eligibility is expanded, which would be the case for us because we're already eligible for the pilot phase. Typically those are made at council and the next council meeting is in the fall. I don't have the specific dates at my fingertip, but that's, that's all on the ICAO uh, Corsia website. Again, Andrew, please feel free if you, <laughs> especially if you want to correct, but if you want to add anything to that. Uh, nothing to correct, but uh, to add, so the next council meeting is scheduled for September to the, for September this year. So that's when uh, we would typically expect to receive uh, confirmation uh, of, of their findings. Um, but as Justin says, it is, we do read into the wording, there could be something a little earlier than that but what I would say is the latest in September, we, we should know the result. Great, thanks. Um, the next question, Indra Deep, thank you, is about VM48 and when the avoided unplanned forest degradation module will be, will be published. So the red team is actively working on that. That's not in, in scope for today, so I don't have an exact date to, to give you um, do feel free to reach out if you use that info at Vera uh, email address and, and that can get forwarded to the red team, but trust that they, they definitely recognize that there's urgency for all of the modules and the data under uh, the new VM48 red methodology and working hard to get that out as soon as possible. Um, the next one is on templates. So which PD, which is project description and monitoring report templates should be used for submission prior to 1st January, 2025? I think we already sort of answered that. So if you're in progress, you do not have to switch. We encourage you to switch and use the updated one as soon as possible if it's not too disruptive for you. Um, one key thing to say, which we maybe didn't say explicitly, if you use the updated version, then make sure that the VVB is also using the correspondent updated version of, of their templates because those, those two things um, align. So anything you have in your project description and monitoring report, we are expecting that the VVBs are reviewing that and confirming that it conforms with, with program requirements. Um, so optional, but encouraged to use that sooner. If you don't want to use it or, or cannot use it, the, the previous published version is, is the one to use that's still eligible until uh, 31st December, I guess. Um, this next one is maybe for Sinclair as well as um, for the auditing and assurance team. So what are VERA's expectations for VVBs checking safeguards of industrial projects that take place on private property carried out by private companies? What is the boundary for assessing who stakeholders are? So it's a great question. Your stakeholders will be specific to your project. And in some cases, some other requirements may not be applicable and that's fine. Just document that and communicate that. But um, I don't know, Sinclair or Joel, do either of you wanna add a bit more, or sorry, Leo. <laughs> um, Leo or Sinclair, do you wanna jump in and add specificity to that? Uh, 
Um, nothing specific from my side, Justin. I think um, a specific question can be sent through to auditing at vera.org and we will address it um, specifically from that side. So nothing to add right now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, it'd be great to hear any specific questions about, yeah, a specific project context so that we can help think through, um, yeah, these different type cases that may come up. But um, in general, auditors are meant to be assessing against all of our requirements, including the safeguard requirements. Um, and as Justin said, you would just need to modify um, the way that you implement each of those safeguards based on your project type. And there may be some safeguards that are not particularly relevant. That's okay, as long as there's justification um, and explanation for that, that would be checked by the BBB. Great, thanks Sinclair and Leo. Sorry, Leo, I was reading Joel and, and thinking auditing and got, gave you the wrong name. So you can kick me later. Um, Nicholas, just wanted to clarify if the VM7 read version 1.7 methodology was submitted and if yes, what's the status expected timeline for ICVCM CCP approval? Um, so the, the details of our submission, including which methodologies we withheld are um, in the announcement that was posted when we did our submission in November. I'll put the link in response to your, your question there. Um, so we did withhold some specific methodologies um, because it was it was clear that they weren't going to meet the the program requirements and we were transitioning to red anyway um, for vm7 we withheld version 1 to 1.6 so that would mean 1.7 assuming <laughs> assuming you have your numbers right i'm not checking off the bat if that's the latest version um, will be assessed by the icbcm or assessment has been requested um, the ICVCM is publishing the status of each of its multi-stakeholder working groups. So there is a working group on uh, red methodologies. Um, so you can check on the ICVCM website and feel free to reach out and we can give you the link if you can't find it easily with a web search. Um, the timelines of those multi-stakeholder working groups are, are quite variable. We're not in control. We are actively participating in all of the working groups. Um, so it's best to just check the website for those updates. The red working group is definitely one of the more complex, um, so it may take a little bit of time. Um, Andrew, anything to add on ICVCM and methodologies? No, nothing here. Okay. Uh, Next question, VM47, most complex yet comprehensive methodologies would be useful for project developers if Vera can conduct a workshop on VM47. Uh, noted, I'll check in with the, the team responsible for that. I thought they maybe had hosted a webinar, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, so it's anonymous there, but if you would like a specific follow-up, feel free to shoot us an email uh, on that. And if you have specific questions, we can get those to the, the team, or if you're just looking for access to more of like an overview and explanation, um, we can see if that's possible. Okay. Um, the next question is back to compensation mechanisms. Will the compensation mechanism be akin to something like ACR has included, a risk profile base, basis, OECD risk ratings, if so, will, of course, see a buffer pool be introduced? Um, so great questions. We've definitely reviewed what, what ACR has included, especially since they are one of the few that have been approved for the first phase. Um, we won't necessarily replicate their process directly. I should say there's two components. One, one component is the who's accountable for if there is a double counting, what's the process and who's accountable for which step, steps in the process. Um, and then the other is what's the mechanism to kind of defray that risk or, or provide um, assurance that, that the accountable parties will be able to follow through and address any double claiming. Um, so we're actively looking at, at both of those things. We will have an explicit procedure on 
what happens if something goes wrong with a corresponding adjustment. And we'll also make sure that uh, we're addressing the, the risk option and providing confidence that, that the program will um, be able to address those double claiming. Um, and we're looking at, at the full spectrum of, of options. So there are insurance products that are uh, under development or, or in some cases even ready for, for market related to political risk that includes um, in some cases the corresponding adjustment risk. So we've had some fruitful conversations with those folks. And then of course we, we operate a buffer for non-permanence. So we're familiar with that and have reviewed what, what ACR has put up. Part of why I'm being a little bit cagey um, in my response is we are anticipating a little bit of back and forth with the technical advisory body. So I, I can't commit today to one particular path um, because I, I don't want that to change once we have the approval. So as soon as we have that clarity and agreement with, with ICAO, we will absolutely be communicating that and we'll host a dedicated webinar on how um, on the, how the guidance works, how the labeling works, how the retirements work, and and these provisions around corresponding adjustment uh, compensation. But again, Andrew, feel free if you want to add anything there. I, I knew you, you were going to ask that. Um, <laughs> I think you've already done a great job. I think it is a very difficult um, field, and you know I think you've given a um, a good and honest response already to where we're at. Okay. Um, and the next question is, does VERA plan to publicly consult before submitting to ICAO? Normally, we would love to do a, a broad public consultation on, on these sorts of things. This is a very specialized um, topic, um, is one comment. And two, the timelines just really didn't allow it, especially when we were initially working uh, towards the April 16th, and we only found out on April 15th, maybe that's too much information, but that that we had extra time. Um, so we didn't have time to do a full public consultation on the options for uh, revocation and compensation. Um, we have had some, some targeted discussions with some very knowledgeable folks uh, in that space. And we also had a very productive discussion with our VCS program advisory group, which is exactly what that group exists for to give us that cross-section of advice from, from knowledgeable people. Um, so we've, we've done what we can to kind of collect input. This is from an anonymous person. If, if you are somebody who kind of has expertise or, or would really um, like to offer to have a detailed conversation, obviously timelines are tight. We won't be able to have a lot of those, but do feel free to shoot us an email and we'll do what we can um, to check those. Okay, the next one is project start dates. Can the project start date be prior to the registration date? Is it possible that there are VCUs issued prior to the registration date? Is there a time limit for defining the project start date? So all of this is in the standard. Um, none of it has changed other than the, the double registration um, issue, which I think is maybe what's triggering this question. Um, but just taking it in order, Yes, the project start date can be prior to the registration date. Uh, in fact, that is probably most often the case. You cannot request registration until you've completed validation. Um, so often it's easier to get that validation done if your project is already up and running. So um, yes, that's, that's allowed. There are some specific time limits depending on the project type. Please look in standard for that. Um, is it possible that there are VCUs issued prior to the registration date? No. So VCUs are only ever issued once we've reviewed both the registration, which includes the validation and the project description and approved that, um, as well as reviewed the monitoring report and the verification report for the particular crediting period. And then once all of that is reviewed and approved, then you're eligible to issue. Um, you can certainly have all sorts of private arrangements, contracts and you, you know, commitments with investors and pre-sales and, and that sort of thing. We don't get into, um, into your contracting business. So in some cases, somebody may have sort of pre-sold in effect their VCUs, but they are not issued and they're not a real thing that can be traded or used um, until 
we've approved all of the uh, necessary documentation. Uh, and then is there a time limit for defining the project start date? So the project start date has a very specific definition in the program definitions. Please read that. It's it's the start of the project activities. But uh, you can get the full wording in the document, of course. Um, so there's no time, light, time limit for defining the project start date. There is a time limit for registration and validation um, from, from the time that clock starts ticking at the project start date. And again, if you have kind of project specific questions, use that secretariat uh, email address there. Okay. Um, remember to use the upvote functions. I'm, I'm refreshing and just taking the top upvoted questions. So if we don't get to your question, apologies, but um, that's that's the basis that we're taking them. So please use that. If the, the next question is, may I check if a project already received LOA and if Vera received ICAO approval, will the project need to propose to Vera an acceptable compensation package before being tag Corsia phase one eligible? Great question. Um, so two separate processes happen in parallel. The the LOA and the VERA approval of, well, we don't approve, but the accepting and confirming that an LOA has all the applicable information and is kind of a real thing from a real country. Um, that is all covered in the Article 6 label guidance. So please do check that document out. So we do have projects that have issued credits that have our Article 6 labels. We have a number of other um, projects that are in various stages of that, that process. Um, so please feel free to use that. That's, that's active. That's separate from if Vera receives ICAO approval. So Vera's ICAO approval currently is for the pilot phase. Once we are approved for first phase, we'll publish our Corsia label guidance. That will include the eligibility conditions both for obtaining the label as well as for retiring a labeled credit um, towards a Corsia compliance um, claim or submission. Um, so all of that will be spelled out in the guidance. So will the project need to propose to Vera an acceptable compensation package before being able to tag as Corsia phase one eligible? Um, so there will be those compensation requirements in the guidance. Um, again, we're just finalizing exactly what, what those procedures and the kind of risk assurance mechanisms are. So that will be published in the guidance and, and we'll communicate that at that time. Um, so reading be between the lines of the question, feel free to be thinking about how to um, mitigate that risk for yourselves if you're a project developer, especially through um, obviously the first and most important step is having good communication with the host country and making sure that you have a, a genuine commitment um, to do a corresponding adjustment and a, a real letter of authorization. That's your, your first and best um, assurance that the corresponding adjustment will occur and then I guess stay tuned for the details of what will be required for the Corsia label as well as Corsia retirement. Um, Shreya asked, is there any minimum time period after the last date of issuance for a project to be inactive? That's a great question. Uh, so no, there the date of inactivity can be exactly the end of your last crediting period. Um, and in fact, often it's best if there's not a gap between crediting periods because the VVB and everyone will want to look at the last monitoring report and look at the next monitoring report. So it can be exactly that day and then your crediting period under the VCS, assuming your registration is approved, um, can be the very next day. Uh, I, I love the Corsia conjecture questions. Um, do you think Vera will be able to tag projects with Corsia phase one eligible credits 
by the end of 2024. So we really do hope so. Um, we're making our submission next week. And the, as Andrew said, the ICAO Council is meeting in September. They're very quick in terms of updating the eligible emissions unit document um, once they make their decision. So assuming that we meet all the conditions and we get a positive decision, then yes, as soon as that decision is made, we would be um, publishing the guidance and, and activating the, the functionality to label credits um, well before the end of 2024. Let's do a quick refresh. Uh, sorry for bouncing back and forth on topics. I guess that's the downside of, of the upvoting, but bear with us. Uh, so deregistration with other program will also include selling of environmental attributes, not directly in the form of GHG, but in terms of renewable energy, as in the case of a lot of countries for domestic renewable energy certification schemes. Um, so not exactly sure what the question is there, but I'll maybe interpret. So um, we do have requirements in the VCS standard for uh, avoiding double counting and double claiming. And that does include credits that are not just a GHG credit, but, but a REC explicitly is, is mentioned there, renewable energy uh, certificate. So you cannot claim, um, any other GHG related attribute through another program for the same program that you're requesting uh, recognition in the VCS and issuance of, of VCUs. Uh, Deregistration specifically depends on the, the program. Um, that's certainly one option to demonstrate that you are inactive in another program if you're wanting to move over to the VCS. So if you have a deregistration that's been processed and you have a date on that, that would be your date of inactivity that you could then use uh, when making your registration request. Um, is there a list of methodologies that you have submitted for Coursera for use in the 2024-2026 phase? Uh, so as a rule, we submit all of our methodologies to, to ICAO to request uh, eligibility for, for Coursea. Um, so our next material change submission will include notification of all new methodologies and updates that have been published uh, since our last material change submission. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, Jules asked, can you clarify if there are any Corsia guidelines specific to new project types, as in new VCS methodologies? I think I sort of just answered that. Um, so there's, there's not much for Corsia specific guidelines. The eligible emissions unit document is, is relatively brief. Um, but as I said, we submit, we notify ICAO as an approved program of all changes to, to our program or all material changes. Um, and that includes all new and revised methodologies. Um, and then in terms of which methodologies are eligible, non afolu methodologies, all of them are, are eligible. For afolu methodologies, there's a specific, there's a general exclusion and then a specific list in that document of the methodologies that are excluded from the exclusion, therefore eligible uh, for credits. That's also on our website right now under Corsia, and we'll be moving that into the Corsia guidance document. Um, so of course we'll reflect whatever decisions ICAO makes for the first phase, we'll reflect that in the guidance document as well. Okay. Um, how are we doing for? I think uh, we're at time now, Justin. So okay. if you want to take one more, we can. If not, um, we can direct all other questions to the other inboxes. There's one more that has three votes. Um, so I'll just cover it quickly. If a project's LOA is revoked, <clears throat> will the project get untagged as Corsia eligible? So this is already dealt with in the Article 6 uh, guidance document that Again, this is going to be very rare, um, hopefully never, 
happens that a LOA is revoked retroactively for credits that have already been issued and tagged. Um, but if for some reason that happens, we would be uh, communicating with the project proponent and the host country. Um, and if necessary, we would remove the Article 6 label from, from that project. We're still working out exactly whether the Corsia label should be all units that are eligible in terms of scope and then the Article 6 label is additional and both are required or if we need to reflect that in a, in a single label. Our hope is that the Corsia label can be an indication of scope and then the Article 6 label can be the indication of Article 6 eligibility. Um, so if that's the case then we would just revoke the Article 6 label but the credit would of course not be eligible for use in in Corsia, which is the outcome that I think matters the most for this question. Andrew, please feel free to clarify that. Yeah, yeah thanks, Justin. And I just wanted to add that the whole topic of revocation of um, letters of authority authorization is also a topic at the, the UNFCCC negotiations as well. They have not yet reached a conclusion. You know, when you listen to the discussions which are happening there, uh, there is a strong awareness in the room that any revocation like this does have, you know, potential for you know a significant market impact, and I, I think there's a lot of countries that are very concerned about that. Um, so we do expect that we will have to be watching that discussion. We'll have to be cognizant of whatever outcome comes from it, um, but you know, and, and hopefully that will give us some results already in in Baku. So we could expect to to need to change our guidance once we receive that. Um, but the general direction is to try and constrain any market impacts that come from it. Um, the, and, and the way that it was being discussed in the Dubai COP was there was only under certain circumstances that uh, such revocations could be possible. So I think the general concern in the market is being heard. The other thing I would say is we do make a distinction between revocation and situations where the country just doesn't do the corresponding adjustment that it, that it says it said it would through the LOA. And as I mentioned before, we do expect that latter case, in fact, both cases to be very limited, um, but uh, we do make that, that, that distinction as well. And I think what's dealt with in the Article 6 guidance currently is uh, what happens uh, in the case where the corresponding adjustment doesn't care and we're going to have to keep this keep up to date with the UNFCCC discussions uh, on the revocation piece. Okay thanks Andrew. Okay thank you very much everyone for listening in and for all the great questions. Um, please feel free to to email us if you have follow-ups at those email addresses that are shown there. We're going to close for today and the recording and slides will be posted uh, shortly. Thank you all.